Um, well, Thess, thank you uh, very much, Corey, for that um, lovely introduction. Um, and also to uh, the people who organised uh, this event, um, particularly the Cal Events team um, and Matt Cleely, um, who've done a wonderful job and made things very easy for me. Um, and thank you everyone also for coming along today. Um, so this lecture is a kind of story. And I have always been fascinated by stories. And as a child, I'd hide under the bed covers with my torch, consuming any reading material I could get my hands on. Thrillers, romance, horror, the classics, I even remember reading the Pocket Bible, which was the only version of that book that could be found in my avowedly non-religious household. The Bible has some good stories, but some of the best stories aren't found in books. They are the ones that we tell ourselves and tell each other. These two are the stories that shape us, that help us understand who we are and where we came from. These are the stories that we call memories. And that's where I want to start my lecture today with some of the memories, some of the stories that have been shared in my own family. I want to think about what those accounts can tell us about the ways in which ordinary working class lives are interwoven with transnational histories. Or to put it differently, how these small stories relate to the bigger stories that we tell in cultural and collective memory about the major events of the 20th century. From that starting point, um, and Corey has uh, said that I'm going to try and connect everything, uh, so from that starting point, I want to think about how first-person accounts or testimonies are used to come to terms with traumatic events on a historical, social, legal and political level. The violence of the 20th and indeed the 21st centuries has been followed by the institutionalisation of instruments designed to deliver justice to the victims of that violence. One result is an increasing transnational collaboration between activists promoting the remembrance of different pasts. I ask how these activists relate to one another. How are these relationships inflected by the cultural flame frameworks, the relational narratives, that tell us how East relates to West and North relates to South? Rose, Bill and Albert. Vera Rose Otten, my maternal grandmother, married young. Something she always reminded me of as I remained childless and wedding ringless into my mid-thirties. The last time I saw her, I was pregnant with my first child, although still unmarried. We talked about uh, the impending arrival, but we talked to strangers. By that time, she couldn't remember who I was. Of course, unlike my grandmother, at the age of 20, I did not have the imminent threat of war to inspire me towards matrimony and motherhood. My biological grandfather, Bill, fought in the Second World War and survived it. The photograph of him in his British Army uniform, that you can see here, is inscribed, Yours until Churchill smokes woodbines. I don't think Churchill ever did swap his famous cigars for the cheap brand of cigarettes favoured by soldiers on the front line. But Bill was killed in an accident in 1949, when he and Rose were stationed in occupied Germany after the war with two young children and my mother on the way. Bill was buried in a military cemetery in Cologne, a grave that my grandmother was never able to visit. Indeed, Rose's life was shattered by this devastating loss. She returned to England but wasn't helped by the army and struggled to support herself and her three young children. It's notable that all four of Rose's daughters were encouraged towards professions that gave them independence teaching, nursing, secretarial work. Rose remarried quickly, she and Albert, the man I knew as my grandfather, and yes, that small child is me, uh, the man I knew as my grandfather and one of Bill's friends in the army were together until his death in 1995. My memories of Albert are fragmented now. I remember the stories he told about the war, some of them actually a little bit too gruesome for his young audience, the shrapnel in his leg, his damaged eardrum, I remember him after his first heart attack, sitting so still in his favourite chair. Of course, I don't remember Bill at all. All my memories of him are not mine. They are mediated through my grandmother, via my mother, or through photographs. I remember tracking down his grave in Cologne when I was on a research visit, laying flowers and feeling an odd kind of grief. Alice and the foster children. Like Rose, Alice Jones, my paternal grandmother, had four children. 
Born in the 1910s, she lived much of her life in the Harold Hill planned community in Essex. Harold Hill was part of the Greater London Plan, which aimed to alleviate post-war housing shortages. The family struggled to make ends meet. I know very little of my paternal grandfather, who died in his 50s, long before I was born. One story that was repeated and recalled throughout my childhood was how Alice had chosen to foster several children from Nigeria, whose parents had come to the UK to study. The photograph shows Alice with her own children and some of her foster children. The article is a local news report about her role as a foster mother. When I look at the photograph, I wonder who those children became. Where are they now in their 70s and 80s? Do they remember Alice? And what do they remember about their time in the UK? At my grandmother's funeral in 2005, my father remembered her kindness and the glorious smell of her bread and butter pudding. How do we remember stories such as these within families? Family memory is interwoven into the everyday. It may come to the fore on particular dates or at particular events, birthdays, funerals, or at family gatherings. However, it is also part of the day-to-day -day family talk, or what Jan Asman has termed communicative memory. Communicative memory is supported by technologies of remembrance, that is, media, objects, and processes external to ourselves that jog our memories and inspire memory talk. Photographs are a technology of remembrance par excellence. They appear to freeze a moment in the past, and yet, when we take them, we do so in the present and future tense. We take a picture now so that we will remember. When I asked my father for photographs of his mother as a young woman, we sat together leafing through his photograph albums as he explained the stories behind the pictures, some of which were taken before he was born. I posted the photograph of Bill in his uniform on my Facebook page, fascinated by the image of this man that I was related to but had never met, who had participated in a history that I have spent a career researching, but which I will never experience. The post inspired further memory talk as one of my cousins recalled the affection with which Rose spoke of her first husband. Photographs are, of course, not the only technologies of remembrance. Graves, or more collectively memorials, can function in a similar way. Indeed, graves sit somewhere between the technologies of family and collective memory. They connect individual lives and deaths with the group histories and memories. Like memorials, they have to be visited, and it is the visitor who determines their meaning. Technologies of memory only function in the context of a relationship between the photograph or object and the person engaging with them. Bill's grave, in a military cemetery but not amongst the war dead, brought me to remember my grandmother's story, our family's story, but to the unconnected visitor, it would function as a memorial to the histories of war and occupation. And just for fun, there's one more technology of remembrance that those in the audience who know me well will have noticed. These are my daughters, Alice and Roses, uh, the children, not the penguins. <laughs> their names spark conversations between us about their great-grandmothers whom they've never met, a sharing of memories that I hope will only expand as they grow old enough to understand more of what it meant to come of age in the first half of the 20th century. Indeed, these family stories are deeply embedded, not only in national, but also transnational histories. My grandparents all lived through the Second World War. Bill and Albert fought in the British Army. Rose worked in a factory assembling motor, motor engines. They had children during the conflict. My father, born in 1943, was one of those evacuated away from London and to the countryside. My mother was born in Germany in 1949, exactly three months after her father's death. The family's only relationship to that country was one of armed conflict and then occupation. But I can't help but wonder if a fascination with, with a history so entwined with that of my family story, war, occupation, division, was one reason I trained as a Germanist. Certainly, I remember that it was my grandmother who taught me my first few words of German. This intertwining of family and transnational histories goes, of course, beyond Europe. Albert joined the army at the age of 15 in 1927 and had fought in conflicts elsewhere in the world. In preparation for this lecture, I asked my aunt, Albert and Rose's daughter, where he had been stationed before the war. 
the answer came. Egypt, Shanghai, Singapore, India, Palestine, Madagascar, India, Iran, and Iraq. As a child, I had heard some of the stories he brought back from those places, notably how he contracted malaria in Madagascar, a disease that destroyed his kidneys and made him unable to have the surgery he needed on his heart later in life. Looking at the atlas now, I see the implication, to use Michael Rothberg's term, of my family history in the history of British imperialism. The empire was not somewhere out there, sustained by the ruling elite who profited from the subjugation of large parts of the world. It was also intertwined with the everyday lives and bodies of ordinary people. And what about Alice and her Nigerian foster children? I've heard this story repeatedly, but it's only recently that I started to wonder about it. Why were the parents in the UK? How does it relate to post-war decolon decolonization? How did these children feel about their experiences? These are questions that other researchers have addressed. As you might imagine, the answers are complex. The practice of private fostering and shifting attitudes towards it were bound up with the key role British educated Nigerians were to play in the process of decolonization. Concern for the potential of these students to be radicalized in their anti-colonial policies, changing border regimes in the wake of national independence, new understandings in Western societies of the parent-child relationship, stigmatization of so-called problem families, proven cases of abuse and neglect, and the growing demonization of white working class mothers. Published accounts by foster children, now adults, suggest a mixed experience. Many remember their foster families positively, but speak of the trauma of separation from their parents, but also from their foster family when they return to their countries of origin. However, such complex questions aren't ones that are or can be answered in family memories, which tend to be communicated from what's been termed the frog perspective. Memories give us insight into individual or family experience. They can tell us what it was like to have foster brothers or sisters from another part of the world in a country steeped in racial division. How it felt to escape poverty by joining an army vested in maintaining colonialism, to fight against fascism on a beach in France, or to occupy a divided country at the height of the Cold War. However, the stories will always be partial and frequently be inaccurate in terms of historical facts and figures. I remember, for example, Rose's insistence that the Berlin Wall, erected in 1961, had definitely been in place when she was in Germany in the late 1940s. Memory plays tricks on us in multiple ways. We always remember in the present and from the perspective of who we perceive ourselves to be now. Our memories can change according to the audience or listener and our assumptions about their expectations. They can change through discussion with others, through encountering alternative versions of events. Research has even shown that individuals incorporate images and tropes from films they have seen or books they have read into their own stories. This is rarely a conscious process. It's not lying or distorting the past. It is simply reflective of the ways in which memories and experiences are used to construct identities that are always formed in relation to others. The lack of factual ac accuracy in individual memories of historical events is one reason, probably the major reason, why historians for a long time eschewed memory as a source of knowledge. The eyewitness was, some proclaimed, the enemy of the historian. The focus instead was on historical documents, archives as sites of knowledge about the past. Nonetheless, the second half of the 20th century saw a change in approach and the emergence of what's known as oral history, a form of history that is dependent on those eyewitness accounts that others avoided. Initially, this movement was viewed as a kind of counter-history, a history from below that would get beyond cold and distancing approaches, focused on politics and warfare, and written from the perspective of those in power, who, after all, are the ones who tend to write the documents that survive their rule. This was about integrating the voices of those who lived through the period, who could, it was imagined, tell us how it really was, and to include the stories of those previously marginalized in mainstream historical writing, women, the working class, people of color. However, this counter figure gradually moved into a central position. 
public history experienced what Martin Sabro describes as an eyewitness boom. Now it is more or less expected that documentaries, museums about the recent past, even textbooks, include personal stories from individuals who lived through the event or period. The assumption seems to be that this approach will better engage viewers, visitors and students with the history being recounted, as it allows them to identify with real individuals and real experiences. Eyewitnesses bring emotion to history, which in turn facilitates empathy uh, with those who lived it. Empathy, it's often believed, promotes understanding. Empathy is intrinsically relational. It's also a particularly slippery term. The philosopher Amy Copeland identifies true empathy as other-oriented and self-other differentiated. By, by this she means that rather than catching the emotions of another person, like we catch a cold, a kind of contagion, we should imagine the situation from another person's point of view, recognising all the time that they are different from us. Without this kind of distance, empathy can be overwhelming. We become fixated on our own distress and distracted from the experience of the person who is suffering now or who suffered in the past. Th this kind of distraction is hardly conducive to historical learning. The oral history movement following the Second World War, and particularly from the 1970s onwards, was accompanied by a drive to collect and record the accounts of survivors of the Holocaust. Annette Vivjorka pinpoints the advent of the era of the witness at the trial of Adolf Eichmann for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes against the Jewish people in 1961. The Eichmann trial was not the first effort to punish the perpetrators of the Holocaust through legal means. However, its emphasis on survivor testimony and the international media coverage brought the figure of the witness to centre stage. The role of the survivors was not only, or perhaps not even principally, to provide evidence that would support Eichmann's conviction, but also to witness the horrors of the Holocaust for themselves and for the millions who did not survive. Shoshana Fellman describes the legal chorus of the testimonies of the persecuted as providing a tale of jurisdiction and a collective tale of mourning. Since then, there have been a number of small and large-scale efforts to gather the testimony of survivors of the Holocaust, notably the efforts of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies in Yale, which holds more than 4,400 testimonies, and the USC Shoah Foundation, which houses nearly 55,000. Here in the UK, the major third sector organisations seeking to promote and support Holocaust education uh, in the UK, so the Holocaust Educational Trust, Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, and National Holocaust Centre and Museum, place the testimony of survivors at the core of their efforts. Indeed, um, as Corey mentioned, I had the privilege of working with these three organisations to produce a guide for teachers across the curriculum on using testimony in the classroom. The National Holocaust Centre is also pioneering in the UK technology that will allow student groups some of the experience of a live conversation with a survivor, even after the loss of this generation. So students listen to a recorded testimony and then are able to ask questions of it and receive a response selected by uh, technology from a bank of pre-filmed replies. Um, so this is known as the Forever Project and the, it, the Forever Project highlights, I think, something really important about survivor testimony. That is, that it is a dialogue, or rather, it is relational. It's produced in a relationship between experience, testimonial text, and audience. When we experience something, Paul Frosch reminds us, we become passive witnesses. To be an active witness, you need to tell someone about it. But to do that, we have to convert the experience into words. We have to use language, which can never convey the experience completely. And then those words, that language, has to be received and interpreted by our audiences. That interpretation will be structured by their way of seeing the world and their experience of it. Anyone who's ever tried to teach anyone anything will know how difficult it can be to transfer something we know and understand into the minds of somebody who does not. This inability to ever communicate a lived experience completely is what Frosch describes as the veracity gap. Frosch suggests the solution to this is to approach witnessing from the wrong end, as he describes it, 
that is to explore the relationship between the audience and the witnessing text instead of between the event and its translation into language. So this complex relationship between experience, text and audience gets even more complicated when we're talking about survivor testimony that is collected with the aim of changing the world, of educating or of supporting efforts towards post-conflict justice. Why is survivor testimony believed to have this power? An important part of the answer to this question is found in what I've already said about oral history in general. The voice of the individual is assumed to facilitate an identification with the survivor community, to promote understanding and to foster empathy. It may be impossible to grasp the magnitude of genocide and mass violence. In the case of the Holocaust, the murder of six million individuals and the persecution of millions more. However, the survivor speaks in the singular. She says, this happened to me. Nonetheless, there's also a second important dimension to the power of survivor testimony, a dimension that is also relational, authenticity and with it authority. Questions of authenticity abound in discussions of survivor testimony, but what does it mean in this context? If we come back to what I've already noted about oral history, that is that memory is slippery and full of holes, we cannot relate authenticity to accuracy. This is even more the case if the memory that we are talking about is traumatic. Survivors frequently misremember details or get things wrong, but that doesn't mean their accounts aren't authentic. Authenticity here means that we, as the audience, believe that the witness intends to tell the truth, that they are giving an account of their experience as they genuinely remember it to be. The important word here is believe. In German, there are two distinct terms, Glaubhaft and glaubwürdig. Glaubhaft means believable and it's usually applied to texts. Glaubwürdig means literally worthy of being believed and is usually applied to people. If we believe a survivor testimony, we are also granting that the survivor witness the status of being worthy of being believed. This can be a powerful form of symbolic reparation in post-conflict contexts. Individuals and groups previously designated criminal or unreliable are granted the status of authoritative voices about this part of the country's past. What this also shows, however, is that authenticity is not something that a text or person has or is. It is something they are granted in a relational process embedded in a particular social context. We can see this quite clearly if we consider the status of perpetrator testimony. While perpetrators may indeed give accounts that detail the event or period as they experienced it, we are reluctant to describe those accounts as authentic because to do so would be to grant perpetrators the status of being worthy of being believed. As Sibylla Schmidt argues, testimony is not only some form of evidence, but a social practice which is based on trust and personal commitment. So how do witnesses make sure that we believe their accounts, to make sure that we consider them being worthy of being believed? An important part of this is who the witness is and on what authority they speak. In the context of traumatic experience and mass violence, this authority is usually granted to those who were there and who were the victims of that trauma or violence. But it's also about the account in itself and the way it's presented. This is where Frosch's suggestion to approach witnessing from the wrong end comes to the fore. We are more likely to find accounts believable if they conform to our expectations about what a believable account would look like. And exactly what that means depends on the context in which the text is produced and received. So for example, in a contribution to the handbook, the Palgrave Handbook of Testimony and Culture, which I'm editing with Roger Woods, Harry Reid and Rebecca Hayes show that in the context of asylum processes, refugee testimonies are expected to be internally consistent and coherent, largely chronological and verifiable uh, in detail, and they should also conform to pre-existing narratives about a particular place and experience. That is what the person assessing the claim feels to be plausible. On the other hand, when it comes to cultural production, there is a recognition that traumatic memory is often fragmented and marked by gaps and inconsistencies. This has become a new marker of authenticity. Accounts that represent the difficulty of retelling are received as believable 
including what Jeffrey Hartman has described as authentic fakes. Hartman is referring particularly to Benjamin Wilkomirski's fragments, Memories of a Wartime Childhood. Wilkomirski published this text as autobiographical and it was initially received as a highly authentic representation of a child's experience of the Holocaust. However, it later emerged that Wilkomirski had not in fact had the experiences recounted in the book, which was subsequently re-re-released as a novel. Looking at witnessing from the wrong end also allows us to see that it's not only the would-be witnesses themselves who are responsible for ensuring the text is received as authentic or the testimony is received as authentic. Testimony can be given live in person, but for it to be distributed across space and time, it needs to be recorded. Witnesses produce their accounts in multiple media forms and genres, video interviews, single authored autobiographies or memoirs, edited collections of witness accounts in documentary films, through new and social media, in the courtroom or at tribunals. In each case, there are other people involved who support the process of creating authenticity. Sometimes the accounts are written down and edited by others. Sometimes an editor gathers accounts and writes an introduction that highlights what they have in common and how they should be read. Filmmakers knit together interviews that have been recorded separately to tell a particular story. Theatre produces stage and frame witness testimonies in specific ways. The case of Wilkomirski, uh, the novel presented as true life, also raises the difficult question about the place of fiction in the production and circulation of testimony. Fiction might seem to be anathema to testimony, which is associated with truth. However, on closer inspection, things are not quite so simple. Hayden White shows that texts are presented as testimonies, including ones with iconic status, such as Primo Levi's, If This Is A Man. And these, te these testimonies include elements that we associate with the writing of fiction, such as metaphors, similes, tropes, and imaginative thinking. These elements combine with the presentation of historical fact to create what White terms figural realism, and the elements of fiction are crucial to create a sense of what it was like to suffer in Auschwitz. Fiction can also be used in more extensive ways by witnesses who re retell their stories in texts that are explicitly designated novels, short stories, or other genres that do not claim to be true to life. In the first workshop of the Culture and Its Uses of Testimony Network, which uh, I ran with Roger between 2016 and 2019, the Romanian and German novelist Carmen Francesca Bonchu described how she used fiction to recount her experiences of life as a dissident author in Ceausescu's Romania because it allowed her to write at a distance and to construct a world that was truthful, even if the things recounted were not always exactly as she had experienced them. And it was at that workshop that Carmen Francesca, Eugenio Schwarzer and I decided to explore further the concepts of authenticity, testimony and different media in a more practical way. Eugenio is the set designer for the Catalan theatre company La Conquesta del Por Sud, who were also members of the research network. Together, we decided we would create an innovative theatre performance that would stage Carmen Francesca's life and literature. Over two years, we worked together to create a land full of heroes, um, also funded by the HRC through a follow-on grant. In it, Carmen Francesca performs as herself, recounting, some, recounting her testimony, some of which was written down for the first time in the play, some of which is drawn from her previous writings. Alongside her, her daughter, Meda Giorgio Bonchu, a professional actor, performs as the younger Carmen Francesca, as the protagonist in her mother's novels, and as herself, a member of the younger generation with questions about the past and its meaning for the present. <coughs> the play interweaves first-person accounts, the physical presence of the witness, performances on Carmen Francesca's literature and the framing of the theatre company, laying bare the blurred boundaries between testimony and fiction. It creates, in the word of La, words of La Conquesta's director, Carlos Fernandez, a poetic level that in other pieces we don't have. The experience of working on Land Full of Heroes also taught me something, as all good collaborations should. It highlighted to me the way in which testimony can function as a form of activism 
as a way of obtaining symbolic justice for those who've experienced human rights violations. <coughs> the potential of testimony to perform this function is recognised in multiple contexts across the world. Survivors testify at legal proceedings and in tribunals, education and community projects. They are encouraged and facilitated to tell their stories through art, including by academics such as myself. I've already noted the benefits that telling, telling one's story is supposed to convey for the survivor, but also for the community of which she is part. Recognition, justice, conflict prevention, education, social healing. Testimony is assumed to offer all these things. Testimony is everywhere, but it's exactly when something becomes universally celebrated that we academics tend to become kind of suspicious. Can testimony really deliver on its promise to facilitate post-conflict peace and re social reconciliation? Can it do that in all times and in all places? The answer is, as you might expect, yes and, and also no. The experience of giving testimony at tribunals, in court, in community projects and through culture often does appear to support survivors in their efforts to walk, work through what happened to them and to feel that experience is recognised by the society in which they live. Ambitious work that brings together opposing groups to tell and exchange their stories has also shown results in terms of better intercommunity understanding. For example, in the Epilogues Project, which brings together Republican and Unionist accounts of the decades-long violent conflict in Northern Ireland, known as the Troubles. Members of the Epilogues team were also participants in our research network. But talking about the past does not always resolve conflict and can, in some circumstances, exacerbate social tensions and entrench opposing positions. We also need to ask ourselves whose interests are really being served by the collection, recording and dissemination of testimony in post-conflict situations. There is an appetite for stories of trauma in the global north. Memory sells in what Emily P Pine has described as the memory marketplace. The interest in the memories of violence and conflict among those who have no such experience themselves has been described as a voyeuristic fascination with the pain of others, a vicarious experiencing of extremes, or even a fantasy of witnessing. From talk shows to auto-fiction, memory sells. Interestingly, this was something that Carmen Francesca was fully aware of as she embarked on our project to stage her life and literature. Emily Pine was co-investigator on the grant. Uh, she's a brilliant scholar of theatre and the best-selling and multiply translated author of her own set of autobiographical essays. She opens her most recent academic book, The Memory Marketplace, with a quotation from A Land Full of Heroes. Carmen Francesca is recounting her journey from Bucharest to Berlin in 1990. She's driven by some friends, one of whom is also a writer, who wants to write about Carmen Francesca's experiences. She says, they will pay the bills during the trip. This is part of our deal. I should talk, disclose. I'm not even aware that I'm selling my impressions, that I'm practicing for the first time for life in the market economy, in capitalism. By 2019, Carmen Francesca was well aware of and experienced in selling her memories in capitalism. However, this passage highlights the complicated ethical decisions that need to be taken by individuals, by us, when we package those memories for new audiences. Those ethical questions are even more urgent when the relationship between witness and mediator involves a significant power imbalance. In particular, when actors from the Global North repackage testimonies from actors in the Global South. Scholars such as Michel Divovani, Didier Fassin and Omri Grinberg have written on the phenomenon of humanitarian witnessing. That is when humanitarian and human rights NGOs gather the testimonies of witnesses to humanitarian catastrophes and restructure and reuse these for the purpose of raising awareness and funds and political and legal intervention. In the process, testimony is sometimes flattened, decontextualized, and political actors are transformed into passive victims. The giving and receiving of testimony in societies recovering from genocide, war, and other mass human rights abuses, including the phenomenon of humanitarian witnessing, can be seen as part of what Leah David has called moral remembrance. David observes that in the second half of the 20th and first half of the 21st centuries, 
a standardized set of norms developed in, in the practice of human rights, including in the use of memory and memorialization. This is a process that Daniel Levy and Natan Schneider have described as the emergence of global cultural memory imperative. Levy and Schneider note that this memory imperative is a European phenomenon emerging from memory of World War II and the Holocaust, but that it has become a decontextualized code for human rights abuses, a universal script that is appropriated in different ways in different local contexts. Levy and Snyder view this largely positively. David, on the other hand, raises concerns about how ways of remembering the past that are European, or in fact German, in origin are assumed to be universally applicable. Indeed, this does lead to some rather odd discussions. Following the murder of George Floyd in 2020, there were calls for Britain to learn from the Germans in their approach to remembering British histories of racism and colonialism. These calls were based on Germany's extensive memorialization of the Holocaust, which does indeed penetrate German public discourse and national identity deeply. However, we might legitimately ask why Britain should learn about remembering imperialism from Germany a country that is only just beginning to debate its own histories of colonialism, rather than, say, in dialogue with colonized peoples themselves. Here we see another kind of relationship, the relationships between different cultures and different parts of the world and the histories that underpin them. In Towards a Collaborative Memory, the book that will appear in August, my aim was to understand these connections more deeply by exploring the relationships between memory activists in different parts of the world even has a cover. Um, so starting with three German institutions dedicated to memory of East Germany, I traced transnational cooperation over a period of eight years, from 2009 to 2016. This included around 800 collaborative activities with partners in 90 different countries. I used a method called social network analysis to map the networks formed by those collaborations and to identify who were the key players in positions of influence. I then examined the texts produced by the German institutions about these cooperations to see how they explain the motivations behind the decision to collaborate and the way they understand that relationship. In relational sociology, a key discipline for the book, this is described as relationship culture. So what did I find out? Firstly, the social network analysis shows the importance of German government and paragovernmental actors in these transnational cooperations. The German Foreign Office, German members of parliament and the political foundations associated with the major political parties are all heavily involved in these networks, often in positions of influence. It becomes clear that German memory is a form of soft power, another export with the quality mark made in Germany. However, the product is not the same across the globe. The stories attached to the collaborations divide the world into a core semi-periphery and periphery. The core is Central and Eastern Europe. Collaborators loca th located there are presented as equal partners, learning together, often in opposition to the dominance of Western European histories that sideline communist oppression. The semi-periphery is occupied by post-Soviet countries that are not within the European Union, for example, Ukraine or Georgia. These collaborators are presented as junior partners, working with supposedly universal, but in fact European memory standards, but still catching up. The periphery is made up of non-European countries, especially post-Arab Spring countries in the Middle East and North Africa, and the Republic of Korea and China in East Asia. These collaborators are presented as students learning from the Germans about the right way to remember or to work towards a democratic future. In these relationship cultures, European ways of knowing are presented as universal ways of knowing. Actors from outside of Europe are denied agency or the opportunity to bring their own perspectives to the table. To move towards a truly collaborative memory, the book argues, European memory standards need to be decentered to become one part of a mosaic that is made up of multiple ways of seeing. So from working class memories shared in families to the transnational activities of national institutions, the past is made up of stories. It is also made up of relationships. The relationships between individuals within families, between the past and the present, between individual experiences and national and transnational histories, 
between witnesses and their multiple audiences, and between transnational actors in different countries. These are in turn embedded in global power relations. Research too is made up of stories and relationships. I hope I've given a flavour of, of the story of my own research career to date, although 41 does seem a little bit young to be doing a retrospective. My research has also been built through relationships with others, those who have guided and mentored me, those who have had the privilege of teaching, supervising and mentoring myself, friends who have become research collaborators and research collaborators who have become friends, the scholars on whose work I build the, and the partners outside of academia, artists, educators, NGOs who have been willing to experiment with me on cross-sector exchange. But I am not just a researcher and research does not happen in, at some place outside of the rest of our lives. So I would also like to acknowledge those other relationships that have been crucial. My parents who have always believed in me, the friends who keep me grounded and listen to me complain when I need it, my husband Sean who keeps the plates spinning, and my children, Alice and Rosa, with whom I now share my love of stories.